Christian Parenting. I'm Julie Lyles Carr. You're listening to the All Mom Does Podcast, part of the Christian Parenting Podcast Network. Today on the All Mom Does Podcast, Melissa Spolstra is with me. She has become just such a precious friend. We got to meet in a really unique circumstance, and I'm so excited for you to meet her. Melissa, thanks so much for being with me today. I'm so excited to talk with you. You're such a kindred spirit, Julie. Oh, amen. Now, tell people who you are, what you do, where you live, the kids, you know, the whole elevator speech. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Melissa Spolstra and I am a Texas girl transplanted to the Midwest for the last 20 years. So I think I have to claim Ohio now I at think this so. point. <laughs> but um, I've been married to my Canadian husband for about 25 years. And we. this is the definition of compromise for a Canadian and a Texan is to live in Ohio. Ohio. So we live, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so we live in a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, right in the center of the state. And we have four kiddos. Our oldest son, is uh, 24. Just this coming week, he'll be 24. And then we have twin girls. They are 20 years old and one in Chicago and one in Cincinnati. And then we have one left at home. So we are just on the tail end of this whole launching the kids. And so she is 18 and finishing up this very interesting hybrid senior year of high school that we're living in right now. And I am a Bible study gal. I just have always been, um, really since college, of just the idea of a bunch of women in a room opening God's Word together and talking about the Scripture and saying, how does my theology meet my reality? How What does this really look like in real life is just kind of my jam and my thing. And so after many years of doing the stay-at-home mom thing, I started back in uh, 2013 uh, writing Bible studies for starting with just the women in my sphere of influence. And then um, by God's grace, I've been able to let that go a little further. So I have seven published women's Bible studies and a couple trade books in there too. One on parenting, believe it or not. I know. (laughs) It feels like that got in there for sure. Now, you mentioned the Bible studies, and that is how you and I got to meet, because your Bible studies and then the one I've done with Abingdon Press, we've gotten to meet through that. What was really fascinating to me, Melissa, is when I finally got to meet several of the authors, we got together and I didn't know what to expect. And what I found was a collaboration of women who technically are kind of competing, right? I mean, in a sense, like we all have these things that we're trying to get out there and it's with the same Mm -hmm. publisher and on and on and on. And yet what I found was this beautiful community of collaboration. And what it got me thinking about is the places in my life and in my career and in my mothering where that hasn't been the case, where there has been sort of this competitive spirit that's come around and whether that has been trying to achieve more than any other homeroom mom or whether that's been in the workplace and really throwing elbows sometimes to try to get ahead. Why do you think it is that as women, we can get into a cycle of not just comparison, because comparison's a big deal, and I certainly want us to unpack that, but also a competitiveness. We don't always really call it, but... Let's face it. I mean, some of the very platforms that we're on and that we utilize both for our personal lives and, and, you know, friendships and for business, there is a competitiveness underneath all of that. Do you find that to be true with the women that you interact with? I do. And I think there's really, for me, that I have experienced in my life, kind of two things at the root of that. So when I first got my first publishing deal, I expected my closest friends to be like, yay, cheer me on. You know, this is going to be awesome. But one of them was also a writer and loved to teach. And she's very gifted. But it really ended up being kind of a wrecker for us. And it was so painful for me, Julie. I mean, I just was shocked because the pain didn't come from where I expected. Like I expected it's going to be hard. I'm going to be nervous walking into the kind of situations like you talked about. I'm in this unknown world, but I didn't expect some people that I thought would have my back to be competitive. One of them literally said to me, you know, I want to be emotionally healthy. So it's just going to be easier for me if you just never talk about this area of your life. Like we can talk about the kids and we can talk about church. And I just remember going, wow, okay, that's really hard for me. And so I think what happens is that sometimes when someone else takes risks and goes hard after things, it 
can make another woman who maybe feels a similar calling or a similar passion that doesn't want to go the distance in that work or maybe doesn't even feel called to, to feel less than or to feel like, is this enough? You know, that because not everybody is called to pursue something bigger. I mean, it is a okay with the Lord if you were called to stay at home and be a mom and serve in your church. And like, that's what most of us are called to. And so when we're comparing, then we can start to use that as a measure instead of what God is asking of us as a measure. And then the biggest thing for me that I found in my own dirty, rotten heart when it comes to this competing thing is a scarcity mentality. Oh, if she sells a bunch of books, then I won't get to. Or if she gets invited to that thing, then I can't. And, you know, my husband planted a church. And I remember when we went through this church planting process, because there can be that mentality with church planting, right? People, we call it NIMBY, not in my backyard. Oh, you know, like, NIMBY, like, nice. <laughs> NIMBY, not in my backyard. And I think we can do that as in the, that same NIMBY thing, even with whatever whatever our calling is. Like, yeah, you go do it, but go do it way over there because there's not enough for us both here. And, and in that NIMBY conversation, I remember saying, you know, when the last lost person has been one for Christ, when the last disciple's been made, then we can go NIMBY on each other. But right. <laughs> Now, there's plenty of women who want to study the Bible, and they need a variety of teachers and speakers and different styles and, and all of this uniqueness thing. And so I think when we identify the root of that scarcity mentality, that can free us to cheer each other on and to say, there's room at the table. This is all kingdom work. This is not the Julie car show. This is not the Melissa Spolster show. This is the Jesus deal, you know? And so I, I do think that's... That's where I've been with this whole competing thing. And I think I'm extra sensitive to it because of when I first kind of stepped into my calling, how I was met. And so I'm like a thousand percent want other people to never feel that way. (laughs) Right, right. I can remember the feelings of this for me beginning really young. You know, when I was in elementary school, there were girls who got to go down. I grew up up outside of Los Angeles, and there was this particular store in a particular mall where they had all the Hello Kitty stuff. And it was very unusual. Like, this was not like a Hello Kitty store on every corner. And they would go down, and they would actually have the whole collection of all kinds of different erasers. Do you remember the eraser? Oh, I I 100% remember Hello Kitty erasers. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I had little girls in my classroom that, I mean, they would line them up and take a look at all of them. And you know, my parents were amazing with us and they were great parents and they were gift givers, but my mom just did not see the value necessarily in making the trip down into Los Angeles to the Hello Kitty store to buy X amount of whatever erasers. And so I can remember just that sense of feeling the comparison in that strange way of, well, I don't have all these Hello Kitty erasers. And then starting to feel the competitiveness, like, well, why do they get to do that? And why do they? And that to me is the the question that I have to do the heart check. When I start asking that, then I can know I'm tipping over, not just into comparison, but now I'm getting over into a competitiveness because it's not just, well, do I not measure up? Which I think is the question of comparison. Mm. To me, the question of competitiveness is, well, that's not fair. Well, why does she get that and I don't? So how do we navigate some of those waters? Because the reality Mm. is there's always someone that God's going to open up a door for that we might love to walk through and we might not get to. And it's not based on how hard we're working, how many email newsletters we're putting out, how many letters of inquiries to publishers, how many times we've pitched for the same job, whatever the industry is, how many times we wanted to do the thing on whatever board. How do we begin to navigate our own self-talk to understand the difference in those two Mm. worlds? I think that's so good. And and I just wanted to mention somewhere I've seen this up close and personal lately is just uh, my husband and I lead a small group Bible study for young couples, young marrieds. Mm -hmm. And none of them have children yet, but they're all like married three years or less. And one couple had a devastating miscarriage, really, really hard. And then for the first time, another girl is pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so we have that. And it's not like they're competing. It's not like they're not happy for each other. But these are real human emotions of why did 
her pregnancy turn out mine mine didn't you know like just those i mean this is on every level i think this is this is partly just our humanity but i think you're so right in saying what are the questions we ask and how can we change the questions and so one of the um question changers i've been working on um that i heard somewhere and i wish i could quote it but i don't know where and it's to, to change the question from why me or maybe why not me Right. Mm-hmm, right. Why me? Why not me? To change that question to what's next. Mm, that's what's great. Next? So instead of saying, you know, why did this happen to me? And we have to sit in that for a minute, right? Like we have to work that out with the Lord. I mean, certainly there's some why me. Jeremiah did some why me in the Old Testament. Yeah. King David did some why me. I do think we have to process those things, and that's legitimate. I don't think our answer here today is just stuff it all and pretend it's not real. You know, like just acknowledging our humanity and our human reactions and emotions. But I think that the nuance changes, we don't sit in those and we don't let those define find us. Right. We acknowledge them. We validate our very real emotions and the green on- monster of envy or competitiveness or comparison are very real. So acknowledging those, but then changing the question and saying, Lord, would you help me now instead of sit in my why me and say, what's next for me? I remember hearing Susie Larson speak one time on this topic of competitiveness among women because she really battled with it big time when she started out. And she said that she would say, you know, when when someone got an opportunity that she didn't get or someone was just really killing it out there and her career was just barely, you know, moseying along, she would say, Lord, bless her, you know, and, and encourage her. And I'm so happy for her. But give me some of that, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so she was like, pray that. So you turn it from, that's just an example of instead of sitting in your why me to say, but Lord, what's next for me? You know, give, give me some of that to you. Right, so. right. I love that. We'll get right back to the interview. But first, I just had to share with you this email that I got in the last week. I was so excited to see it come into my inbox. You see, it was an email from World Vision, and they were letting me know that my picture had been sent to Bangladesh. And that means there is a child in Bangladesh who I hope is getting ready to choose me to be their sponsor. It's just so amazing to think about, oh, wow, there's someone in India right now. There's a child right now in India who is looking through pictures, looking through who they want to choose to be their sponsor. And my picture and my information are are in that pile for them. What World Vision tells me is that I should be receiving information about who I've been chosen by in just a few days. So be sure and tag along for this incredible journey that I'm getting to have about being chosen. And I want to invite you to, I want you to be chosen. So go check out what that looks like, what it means to be chosen and how you can be chosen at worldvision.org slash AMD. That's worldvision.org slash AMD. Can you speak to something that I still have a hard time identifying or often seeing that it's there. And that is this, a hidden competitiveness. And what I mean by that is this, that you can have those people surrounding you who seem to be team Melissa and excited for you. And isn't that awesome? But over time, you begin to realize there's a little bit of a chipping away. You know, in the first situation that you identified, I mean, one thing I got to give props to those girls about was they were real clear with you about mm-hmm. <laughs> it, they hurt. Were. it hurt. And I but appreciate there was, yeah, that. There was nothing underlying. You weren't having to figure it out. But sometimes we can have right. someone in our world, or maybe we're even the ones doing it, who bring a hidden competitiveness to where we're saying all the right things or we're receiving the right kind of verbiage. But there is an underlying current that we start to realize that maybe our friend is a little more short with us or they're avoiding us a little more or whatever. Mm -hmm. How can we be careful to make sure that we're keeping the people who we need to be speaking in our lives on at full volume or for ourselves, if we begin to identify that maybe we have some hidden feelings of competitiveness? Mm -hmm. How do we begin to bring that out to the light so it doesn't fester? Yeah. I mean, it, what what you're saying just makes me think of the whole thing with anger. Everybody mm-hmm. has anger, right? Mm-hmm. Some are spewers, some are stuffers, and some are what we call leakers. 
Mm. So I think you're you're speaking to the leakers. They're I think, not yeah, I think you're right. Out, out, you know what I mean? They're the ones who are like, I'm not mad at you. And in their head, they're like, but I'm not going to invite you to my party. Yeah. You know, like, like there's that like, <laughs> yeah. there's that like where those that frustration or that anger leaks out. And so, you know, that's why I think it's just so helpful that we know our tendencies, you know, that may be something for our listeners out there to go, hey, let me identify which one of those am I? Am I more the overt who just says it out? Or am I more the person who tends to be a little more passive aggressive, not trying to, but we just we're wired up in different ways. And so I think by identifying that in ourselves, and then just, I think so much of the Psalms that say, you know, search me, oh God, and know my heart and reveal to me anything there. So I definitely am a huge believer in blind spots because I know how much I have them. And on the regular, I'm like, God, show me my blind spots. And then in addition to that, I have about three women that I have given full on permission to speak into my life when they think I'm off course, or maybe I'm being a little passive, or, you know, these are the ones who would know if that green monster of envy is creeping up, and I don't even realize it. And I've given them permission to say, hey, are you making this about you? Or hey, what's at the root of you not cheering that person on or just doing it in words and and not in action. So I think that can be helpful to, to help others to be accountable. But I think it really just does knowing yourself and then being aware that we all have blind spots. You know, it makes me think about with Saul and David. And in some ways, I think that comparison and competitiveness go hand in hand. But there are times that they really don't. And what I mean by that is this. I look at someone in Saul's position. He's the king. He's got all the wives. He's got all the kids. He's got all the money. He's got all the power. He's got all the things. And he still feels competitive toward David. You know, Mm -hmm. feeling threatened is a great warning light to make us understand that there is a spirit of competitiveness that is entering into a relationship. Well, and it's because if you think about that scenario you just brought up, that's where they were saying he heard the women singing the songs. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And so he's looking for his validation in the eyes of the response of the people. And I think, let's be honest, all of us at times, you know, gauge a social media post by how much traction it got or gauge a joke we told by how much laughter there was or gauge how we're doing as a mother by how many people told us our kids were great, you know? So like, I do think it's really easy for us and our humanity to slip into looking for validation for whatever it is we do by the, whether we're getting roses or stones from whatever our crowd looks like. Right. And I I think we see this with women toward one another. But I also think there are a couple of categories that get interesting as we continue to talk about this. I've seen competitiveness in marriage between marriage partners. Mm. And with the work you and your husband have done with a lot of young married couples, where do you sometimes see that show up? Oh, it can be so huge. And again, to me, it all seems back to this conversation about identity. Mm -hmm. Because when you are rooted in, I am loved by God, I am called by God, I am not why me, I am what's next, I am not defined by what I do, who likes me, uh, how much money I've made, I am defined by the fact that there's a God who loves me and sent his son to die for me. And that is where I think health comes and where we see competitive in, in marriages, competitiveness in marriages, is when instead we are defining ourselves by those other things. You know, if they're both making money and one's making more than the other and they're finding that that can work fine. Different couples make different amounts of money and and that's okay. Or maybe one's not even working at all. But if your identity is so rooted in who you are in Christ, I think it helps that competition to fall away. I was, you know, like I said, for so many years, a stay-at-home mom and, and just doing the kid thing and doing local ministry and loving it. And when I stepped into this, a lot of people have asked my husband, how he's felt about this, because he's been a lead pastor, a church planter, a campus pastor. And honestly, I was the background girl. I mean, I did not like to be up in front of people. He has a very engaging, charismatic personality. And so people have wondered how he was going to do with, you know, in reality, just me being on bigger stages than him. And it's been so fun to watch Julie, my husband, cheer me on. I mean, literally zero level threat for him. Because, and I think it does just stem back to, 
where he finds his worth and his value. He's really healthy that way. And he's able to celebrate me way more than I celebrate me. I mean, he is just, I mean, he, anytime he posts anything about me, it's hashtag my wife's an author. Oh, <laughs> it's, so, it's so cute. But I guess, you know, my long answer to your short question is that I, I see it in these young couples. I see it all around me. And I think just so much of it comes back to identity. Where am I rooted? Where am I getting my validation? What's really forging those questions? Who am I? Right. You know, part of it, too, that I notice in my kids is I have kids who seemingly from birth forward and, you know, in the case of twins, and you have twins, too, even in the womb, uh, we're just a little more competitive. (laughs) When I when I look at the story of Esau and Jacob, for example, speaking of twins, Let's face it, Jacob was one dang competitive guy. I mean, he just was not content with the birth order and the meaning of that and his time and place and culture. Fueled a little bit by his mama. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> with By his competitive mama, his, his, yes. you know, his Hollywood mom was definitely pushing him onto the stage for right. sure. And so I wonder, too, if sometimes what we deal with in that identity piece is we may have been designed by God with a little bit more of a competitive edge. And here's the beauty sometimes of that competitive edge. We need people who are warriors. We need people who are willing to risk it all to go after the thing that they think they're supposed to do. And and that's not always a bad thing. But how do we make sure with our kids that we are both valuing who they were designed to be and at the same time not allowing things to slide into a weird space? Because I got to tell you, when all my kids get together and they play a game of risk, which, by the way, I try to beg off of every time. I I, have observed... I love that game. Okay. I want to dominate the world. So I'm the person you're talking about who's a little bit competitive. <laughs> you know, I'm the, I'm the Enneagram three. I want to achieve. I want to dominate the world. So I would love to play risk with your kids. Uh, they would Bring love that. They are always trying to recruit. There's like three or four of them. And there's one in particular who deeply, badly, so much wants to play risk all the time. And he's competitive in a lot of places. I'm a three, two also, but I have this two wing. And so I'm kind of like, well, but I want you to be happy. Like, I want to really right. too, but I really want to. And boy, with my kids that are competitive, they can have some throwdowns over those games. But the competitiveness doesn't stop there, as we were referring to Esau and Jacob. Sometimes it can be competitive right. for mom and dad's attention. And you can have one that if you're not careful, can kind of just evaporate and not really hold their hand up for I need some attention. While you can have another one who is like, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. How have you navigated those waters with the four different personalities in your household? I think this is a tough space for moms, and I haven't always done it well. I think particularly with the twins, my twins are identical girls. And I remember one year we did the Awana car races, like the Pinewood Derby, and one of their cars won and one of them didn't. And so we've got the the celebration of the one so overshadowed by the defeat of the other, right? So it's like so hard to celebrate because there's always a loser, it feels like, in the situation. And I do have very different kids, all of them. And I love what you're saying. And I would just say, moms, to be really intentional about making sure the kid who isn't always raising their hand, who is it, they can fall below the radar And I saw just my last child um, in middle school, just, you know, she's very happy go lucky. She's a just a real outgoing, fun personality. But there were all, all these things going on underneath the surface. And at the time, my older daughter was still navigating alopecia which is an autoimmune disorder where mm-hmm. she had to wear a wig and, and uh, I, you know, we had to get tattoos for her eyebrows and try to figure out eyelash things. And I think at times I was so consumed with the glaring thing that I missed. And, and I think kids, don't you find, I mean, you have eight, <laughs> that sometimes they sense, oh, mom, I can't be bothering mom with this right now because she's got the other sibling's problem that's right, bigger. Right. And so I, I just... I think as moms, this is such a such a heart issue to be able to be constantly on the lookout for maybe the quieter one or the one, it, you know, asking the questions, seeking them out. And this is tough for us as moms because we've got we've got all the things going on. But I do look back at times and wish maybe that I'd navigated a little bit better, not just going for the urgent and mm-hmm. missing the important. 
And right. so I just think that the, the answer to that is just, again, the reflection, the prayer, the thinking, the being intentional, asking the Holy Spirit to just reveal those things to us. But man, I, I hear you there with that, with those things. Yeah. With kids, it really is an interesting dance, both the the way they come to us prepackaged and the things that we're trying to draw yep. out in them. You know, sure. you have done a deep dive into the names of God and the purpose of that being really understanding his character so that we can understand who we are in him. And that is one of the primary antidotes for this whole conversation about comparison and competitiveness and and those places where we can get so spooled up for something that we think we're missing or we think we're lacking or if we only had. Right. And yet, is that really what God says about us? So what are the things that stand out to you in this conversation about comparison and competitiveness when you think about the attributes, the character of God mm-hmm. and how it applies to us? Yeah, I can't help but think of, there's so many different great names for God, but I think about Yahweh, which we were just talking about, yeah, um, yeah. is associated with the word for breath, that right. they didn't say it, that it was Yahweh, hey, and I, yeah. I love that, I love that, but um, it's there in Exodus where God's revealing himself to Moses as Yahweh, the I am, that's what his name means, the self-existent one, the great I am, but there's two questions there that Moses has, who are you and who am I? Mm. And to me, that's what this comes down to, this right. whole conversation. Who is God? And in light of that, who am I? And so we can't answer the second question without the first, because the danger is we'll create a God in our image instead of realizing that we were created in his, right? right. We'll say, well, I think God is like this or that. And what I love about the names of God is that God does, re- one name can't capture him. He's just so otherworldly. He's so supernatural. He's so incredible that he has these different names that he reveals throughout scripture in the moment of people's need. Like, I mean, some examples would be when Hagar, this Egyptian maidservant, is out and she's been mistreated and she feels unseen. He reveals himself as El Royi. I am the God who sees you. Mm -hmm. Um, There's someone else, Gideon, where he says, I am the God who heals you. Other times he revealed himself as, I am the God who provides for you. So now think about this conversation we've had about like scarcity mentality in comparison. If we really believe our God who loves us, who pursues us, who sent his son to die for us, is the source of our provision, is the source of our healing, is always sees us, that we're never alone, that he's self-existent, he doesn't need us. And as we see him for who he is, then we can answer that question that if this incredible God thinks I have value and believes in me and has given me purpose and longings and wants to use me as his instrument, which is what we read in the scripture, then I do have value and worth, not because of what other people think about me, not because of how many mom compliments I get, not because of how much money I make, but it really does change that focus of our identity. And so I just really enjoyed studying the names of God. I went through and looked for the law of first mention. So Mm -hmm, the first mm -hmm. time they're mentioned in scripture, there's something unique about that in theology when we find it just a first mention of something. And uh, so I went back and looked at those and I did first the L names, which are like El Royi, El El Yon, Elohim. Then I spent two weeks on the Yahweh names because that Yahweh name then has all these compound things with it. Right, Yahweh right. Yira, the provider, Yahweh Ra, my shepherd, you know, the Lord, that's the, a way to look at it, I think, for a layman, because these words aren't always in our scriptures, are uh, whenever you see the word God, it's usually an El name, like mm-hmm. Elohim. And when we see the word Lord, it's usually Yahweh. And so sometimes we'll say the Lord God, and there literally it says Elohim Yahweh, Yeah, you know? So it's like the mighty creator and the personal God together. That's the Lord God, and Mm -hmm. I I love that picture. And then the last two weeks I spent on the Trinity, which is the Father, Abba, Abba, and Adonai, the Holy Spirit. There are names for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Ruach, the um, Teacher, the Advocate. And then the last week was all the names of Jesus, which I could have done a whole study on the names of Jesus, you know? Yeah, Savior, Redeemer, Messiah. So I do just find that focusing there helps us ask that move from that why me to that what's next. I love that. Why me to what's next? You know, it's interesting to me because if we understand 
I love the way you put this in sequence, that if we first understand who God is, then we answer the question of who we are. And you're right. So often we invert that model and we yes. begin seeking, well, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose here? Without first establishing and understanding who God is. And it is a very important step. <laughs> There's a sequence yes. that needs to take place. And that sequence really should start with who God is. You know, another sequence I think that we get out of context within the understanding of who God is and what he created us to be, is we keep waiting for someone to pick us. And I think that's part of the nature of competitiveness, Mm -hmm. that we see someone get an opportunity we wanted. We see the boss recognize someone for a project that we thought we put a lot of hard work in also. We see someone elected to the board or we see someone get chosen for something we wanted. And we begin this process of allowing our worth to be established by someone human who is going to pick and choose. And I can remember going through a season where there was something that I really wanted badly. And I worked super hard, Melissa, and I kept putting myself in the position and I kept Mm -hmm. doing jazz hands. I kept doing all the things. Right. (laughs) And there came the day that I just had to sit in. Jules, they're not going to pick you. So then what happens? What do we do? And one of the phrases that I've been working with a couple of my kids on is, well, then you pick yourself (laughs) because, because God chose you. Yes. And to make sure that we're not in our desire to do more in maybe the national, natural competitiveness that we may have come as part of the package of who we are to not give away the power of who's supposed to choose us to another human. To yes. do exactly what you're talking about and get back to who God is. And his word says that he has chosen us. So whether another human chooses us for a position or to date us or to give us the, you know, advance right. in the career or to give us the shot or whatever. I love that notion of establishing first that it's God. You know, you and I were talking about this before we got on the episode. There's a line in Hamilton that really makes me think about this. And really in the context of who God is and all of the facets of him. And it's where Aaron Burr in one of the lyrics realizes that there was room enough in the world for Hamilton and me, he says, you know, that he had thought so long there was only room for one of them. So what do you see in the identity of God and the names of God that shows us that he's got room, he's got purpose, he has resources for all of us to be in this world at this time? Yeah, I mean, just to say, I'll start with Elohim, just to say that he created you and that he created you with purpose. And if there was anyone else who could do what he's called you to do, he wouldn't have done that. And so to say, you, you're, there are unique things. Only you can mother your children. <laughs> Only you can be the kind of grandma who reads the Bible stories. And you know what I mean? There are certain things that you are so uniquely equipped to do that sometimes I think we miss because we talk ourselves down or because we have the scarcity mentality or because we're so – we even – I call it false humility. I think sometimes in the church particularly, and especially as women, we think that to be humble or to be meek means not to step out into our calling and not to do what we're doing with fervor for the Lord with a thousand percent of what we have. And so I just want to encourage you that, yeah, if you understand who God is, then you'll understand that he doesn't make any junk, right? Like he, <laughs> yeah. just, he doesn't do it. Yeah. He doesn't make any junk and he he doesn't do anything willy nilly. I always say he never leans over the balcony of heaven is like, oh, whoopsie. I yeah. didn't, you know, like <laughs> he has, he has a plan. He has intention. Yes, life is hard, and yes, there are many obstacles, but just as we see him for who he is, we will see ourselves for who we are, and it's a good plan because he's a good God, and I think there are times where we just need to remind each other of that. I know there are days where I just need to be, so Jules says, it's a good God, and he's got a good plan, and that's why we can ask what's next. Absolutely. Melissa, it's just so amazing to have you on. I know that my listeners are just going to adore you. Be sure and check out Names of God from Melissa, his character revealed, plus a whole a whole library of other stuff that she's worked on as well. Just incredible resources to help all of us in our faith journeys. Melissa, thanks so much for being with me today. Thanks for having me on, Julie. It was a pleasure. You'll find more from this episode on the show notes. Be sure and check them out at allmomdoes.com. And wanted to ask you a big favor, be sure and go to wherever you are listening to this podcast and give us a five-star rating and review. It really helps us get the word out about the podcast. Can't wait to see you next time on the All Mom Does Podcast. (laughs) 